Will you hand me my mask? I'm going to put it back on when I come off the stage. Perfect, thank you. I'm trying to stay on the mask thing. It's... I always wear one like Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, you and I, we share this concern. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? I appreciate you. So glad to be here. Oh, no, you good. You don't look bad. You look. Correct. That's true. Okay, yep. Central State Library Resource Center and the African American Department. And it is my pleasure this evening to have two wonderful people here to have a discussion tonight. So on behalf of Ina Pratt Free Library and the CEO of the department and all the uh, trustees and board of directors, we welcome you to this beautiful building. And we're so glad to have back in-person programming. So thank you all for coming out this evening. So this evening, Brittany Cooper will be in conversation with Shanta Trevetti about her life and work. And I would like to introduce Brittany Cooper, who is Associate Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and Africana Studies at Rutgers University. She is author of the New York Times bestseller, Eloquent Rage, A Black Feminist Discovers Her Superpower, what an awesome title, <laughs> and the award-winning Beyond Respectability, The Intellectual Thought of Race, Women, and the forthcoming children's book, Stand Up, Ten Mighty Women Who Made a Change. She is also co-author of Feminist AF, A Guide to Crushing Girlhood, and co-editor of the Crunk Feminist Collection, and co-founder of the Crunk Feminist Collective, and many of you may know her as a regular on MSNBC, which is where I was first introduced to Brittany and, and saw her and loved her and was able to have her to come to prep. Okay. So in conversation with Brittany will be Shanta Trevetti, who is an assistant professor of law and the faculty director of the Sarah and Neil Meyerhoff Center for Families, Children, and the courts at the University of Baltimore School of Law, where she teaches family law and child welfare courses. Before joining academia, Trevetti was a staff attorney at the Brooklyn Defender Services, family defense practice representing low-income parents enrolled in the child welfare system. 
As a result of this experience, Trevetti focuses both her legal scholarship and editorial and popular media on the topic of family separation with a spotlight on race, poverty, and gender. Please give a warmer welcome for Brittany Cooper and Shanta Trevetti. Well, what a week. Um, <laughs> Judge Jackson is down the street at her confirmation hearings, and Dr. Brittany Cooper is here in Baltimore with us. We're so happy to have her. So I wanted to start just by talking about you and your career. What made you want to be a professor, and why focus on the area of race and gender and sexuality? Oh, interesting. So funny. Um, I actually was just... Um, talking about this a bit earlier today. So my mentor um, is a Baltimore native, uh, Dr. Lawrence Jackson, uh, who was my professor uh, in a freshman comp class at Howard University uh, nearly 25 years ago. Uh, and Dr. Jackson walked into class on the first day, put a map of the world on the floor. And so we're all sitting in a circle, it's a co composition class, peering at the map, Africa is drawn and it looks bigger than all of the, you know, sort of neighboring continents. Um, and so he says, so we're all looking at it going, why does this map looks weird? Something's wrong with the map. And he says, this map is drawn to scale. And so all of us 17 and 18 year olds, you know, our heads explode, heads explode emoji, you know, and we're all <laughs> like, what's going on? And then he says, well, so why do you think that you would have never seen a map like this in your life? And this is to a room full of black students. And so the lesson was in the question. And I was like, that was cool. I mean, I learned something, but also like, I wanna be able to do that thing, right? Um, and so that was the, you know, the start of my thinking about what it would mean to be a professor. I'd always wanted to be a teacher, but it never occurred to me that you could teach big kids. I'd never seen really seen professors. And so, um, so I, yeah, so, you know, Dr. Jackson uh, is close to my heart in that way always because uh, my world was opened up expansively in that way. And, and I wanted to also do work that related to real world concerns. Um, I didn't want to be kind of in one of the academic disciplines where you got the, um, where you got to sort of engage in the fantasy that you, you know, that you were removed, that the things you were learning were removed from real world application. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I'm in rooms full of young folk um, of color, you know, um, first gen students, undocumented students, queer and trans students, uh, non-binary students, this work matters for their lives. And the students that may not meet them may have privileges across those categories. I know that someday they will be somewhere running things and I want them to have some tools to help them to do that in ways that feel equitable and just. Um, that feels like the work I was prepared to do when I was a student at Howard, the work I was prepared to do growing up as a working class white girl in Louisiana. Um, and, um, you know, and so it's work that I really, I take pleasure in doing. And despite, you know, I do lots of other things as my bio suggests. I write, I get on TV and, you know, I'm a talking head on occasion and I enjoy that. Um, but I tell people like, I think fundamentally the thing for me about being a professor is I actually really do see myself as an educator. Um, I think that like that is for me like a core identity. Um, and so I think that 30 years from now when no one calls me to be on the television, if I can still be somewhere in a classroom like talking slightly crazy to my students, I'll be really good with that. <laughs> you know? All right, well, let's talk about Eloquent Rage. Yeah. Ever since I read that book in a book club of brilliant, strong woman and one very brave man, um, I have aspired to that, and I feel like I have the rage part down, mm -hmm. but the eloquence is where I'm working. Um, what is eloquent rage, and why is it a superpower? Um, you know, so when I was working on my PhD, um, I ended up having to take over a, a senior seminar for my professor, my dissertation advisor, uh, who was sick. And so I would be in class, you know, it's a, a black woman writer's course. We're talking about novels, um, 19th century, 20th century. Uh, and later, uh, maybe a year later, I ran into one of the students from that course, one of the most brilliant students in that course, black girl. And she says to me, I used to love listening to you lecture because um, your lectures were filled with rage. And so I'm, I'm like, what do you mean? 
you know, because this is not what you want someone to say when you're a professor, you know, you're being professional, you know what I mean? measured and poised and all these things, <laughs> especially at that time in my career. I don't care about that so much now, but I cared about <laughs> it um, when I was in my 20s. And, you know, she said, but your rage, she said it, they were filled with rage, but it was like the most eloquent rage ever. Um, and I was immediately defensive and did the thing that black women do when we get accused of anger, which we're often accused of. I was like, I'm not angry, I'm passionate, right? Um, and so she did this kind of black girl read and she was just like, you know you're angry, Brittany. Mm -hmm. And see, only black girls can do you that way. Like they pin you with this look and they're like, I see you, right? Um, but it was, but she was not wrong. That was the thing. And I think it was, it was transformative for me and it has stuck with me um, now for the better part of 15 years, I would say, uh, because what I realized, what I heard when I reflected was that she wasn't saying you're angry and therefore irrational, untrustworthy, dangerous, uh, and you know unprofessional, and so therefore not fit to teach. She said, it's the thing that makes you authentic, that you don't, you're not removed from the material. When you're talking about things that Black women in the 19th century wrote about and went through, we can sense your anguish, your pain, your indignation that they went through it, and it makes a difference in our ability to connect to that material. And I think also because she was navigating the very elite private space where we both in school, um, elite, private, white, you know, kind of affluent space, that she needed to see a model of someone who showed up and did the work and the anger didn't have to be hidden. It could just be transforming how the work was being taught. So it showed up as a kind of energy connection and authenticity as opposed to a barrier um, that allowed you to be heard. And very often um, for black women, and I would argue that this happens for women in general, like, you know, you can be in spaces where, you know, where, where you're called emotional or folks are like, why are you so mm -hmm. you know, angry, right? That had that kind of condescension. It's sexist in addition in many cases to being racist. Um, and, you know, and so I think that being able to say to black girls, we live in a world where people do things to induce our rage. Example, just watch 15 minutes of those Supreme Court justice oh hearings. Literally today, my group chats have been on fire with black women being cussing. It's just cuss words in the group chat because black women are watching that going, why are they speaking to her like that? Right. And we, and you know, you know, the sort of, the, you know, the sort of like reserve things. We go, you know. I mean, they're testing her, yes, and also trying to provoke her rage and then knowing that the minute she expresses it, she will be disqualified, mm -hmm. right? And that we don't have to do any, like that they, they won't be accountable for the outrageous, offensive, egregious things they're saying. They will get away with it on the basis of politicking or testing. And here's the thing, most of us, none of us have ever had the opportunity to interview for a Supreme Court justice job. And if you don't think that that's the life of the black woman professional every single day, that is what it is like, particularly if you are in an elite space, people who you're often more qualified than literally testing you and questioning you and making you justify it. And, and you have to be completely poised at all times. And that's why I became a professor because I'm not with that shit and I'm not going to be poised at all times. <laughs> I'm going to keep working on my eloquence. <laughs> um, yeah. So you also wrote a feminist AF, yeah. uh, a guide to crushing girlhood, yeah. which I enjoyed. Um, I first became aware of that book actually listening to you with your co-authors, Dr. Tanner and Dr. Morris on Melissa Harris Perry's podcast. Mm. And I was just in awe listening to you all talk about your relationship and your admiration and love for each other. Mm. Um, might have shed a little tear. Um, why did you decide to write this book together? You know, look, part of, you know, all of us probably in many ways have navigated, you know, having to be the first or having, you know, in some way, right? And that only really is sustainable when you have crew. Um, and a lot of us are in the legacies of people who were first who didn't have crew. Um, and sometimes they bared the scars of that. And we said very early in our careers, most of us have known each other for a really long time. We said to each other as a crunk feminist collective that we would go together, right? Um, and in that way, we resisted the thing that is often held out as a carrot, particularly to overachieving people of color and overachieving women, right? Which is, if you're willing to leave everybody in your dust, mm -hmm then we will give you all of the carrots. And we were like, yeah, but that's like a Faustian bargain, right? 
because you get there and you're lonely. And then at the heights of your career, you don't have anybody to call, right? No one to show up when you need someone to have your back. And it's also kind of like a white supremacist idea that there's scarcity and that there's not room for everybody else, right? And that there's only room for one. Um, and so we have tried as a collective practice to resist that. Um, and so we came together, we've written a couple of projects together as the CFC, but we've also, we, you know, even during the pandemic, you know, I called everybody up. We had a blog, but, you know, there was like the depth of a feminist blog, maybe with you know, a time declared in like 2019 or something. But people really weren't reading blogs anymore. And so last year I called everybody up and I said, well, now they're calling blogs newsletters. So let's just call it a newsletter and start it in, right? Um, and so we did. So we, we write this newsletter every week called The Remix. Um, where we sort of just are thinking about what it means to be in a really different space in our feminism. Now, when we started, we were all like late 20s, <laughs> mid 20s, and your feminist concerns are different than when you're middle aged. You know, we didn't have tenure, now we do have tenure. You know, all of these sorts of things are happening. You know, kids, partnerships, deaths um, of partners, all kinds of things have happened. Um, and what does feminism have to say about life? in that middle space, not when you're young and you're just getting it, not when you're like a sage elder because you know, you've know you lived and you can actually share your wisdom, but you're in the middle of it. You're in the thick of things that you don't know, right? And so we're like working through that together. Uh, but I would also say to me too, that, feminine, that friendship is like my core value. Mm -hmm. I, I believe in that. Mm -hmm. I will fight you over my friends. In fact, I will fight you about my friends quicker than I will fight you for myself. That's like a thing about me. Do not mess with my friends. I believe in taking sides. I will also call my friends up and be like, I don't even think you got that right, sis. Like, let's talk about your whatever, but also don't come for my friends. Right? We need some of that though. What's wrong with that? Right? Um, that's the reason why our girls' trip was like a blockbuster movie in 2017. Okay. Okay. And then the next summer when I was at Essence, you couldn't move around in New Orleans. <laughs> Because everybody was on a girl's trip, you know, <laughs> trying to relive. Like I was like, what's going on here, right? But it's but it's because we know that the places where people see you up close and they have your back, we all long for that. And yet somehow we live in a world that has told us the thing that matters more is career or romantic relationship, right? And it's like, look, I have a bae and he's lovely and he's sitting in the audience being very conspicuous. I appreciate that. <laughs> And also, you know, but also my girls are my soulmates too, right? Um, you know, they, they, you know, we were uh, out to dinner, some girls, the homegirls and I this weekend, and, uh, and, you know, they were bringing like lovely dishes to the table and dessert and cocktails, and we were like, here we are on a romantic evening together again. <laughs> um, and so, but, but why not, right? Because in some ways my greatest romances, right, have been with my girls. Um, and I think that's, that's all right to say and to live. And I think it's and I think it's feminist. I think feminism gives us permission to name the thing that is true, um, and that's the thing that feels true. But it's like if you wrote that transition for me, um, I was struck by your how central friendship was to your definition of feminism, and every aspect of my life has been enhanced by the women uh, who are close to me. Many of whom are in this room. Hi. Um, <laughs> but you also talk about the other side of it, right? But maybe not the other side. A key part of that, which is the homegirl intervention. Mm -hmm. What is a homegirl intervention, and why do we all need them? Look, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have become a feminist if one of my homegirls hadn't been like, you know, so I was in college and I was running around at Howard and I was saying, you know, feminism is white women's shit. You know, black women are womanists if they're anything, but like, we don't, you know, we don't have feminist struggle, this and that. He was completely uninformed. Because I hadn't actually read anything, so it was actually done. I just heard it and I was like, you know, still dealing with my like uh, trauma over like a lifetime spent having to be friends with white girls um, as a kid. You know, you take, you know, whenever, I mean, look, this is still a problem today. You take all these honors in advanced class in a place like where I grew up, and so you're just in a room where black and brown children have been like systematically removed from those spaces. So you're just in a room for white kids. If you want friends, then you deal with them, right? Um, and so I had lots of stuff about that. And so I wasn't trying to like align my politics with white women in any way. And I understood feminism to be a white woman's thing. Um, and so one of my homegirls like heard me say this. And what I love about her is 
I feel like maybe her brow wrinkled, but she didn't like call me out in the moment. And then we get back to the dorm later. She looks over across the hall to me. She knocks on the door and she's like, um, you were talking real crazy today. <laughs> Here's a book. <laughs> Read it. <laughs> Here's an essay that you would really like in this collection. And when you finish with that, come over and let's talk about it. Um, and I was like, oh, wow. Okay. You know, it's like the per that's like a homegirl snatching your coattails and being like, you're out here raggedy and your stuff is not right. I love you. I'm not going to embarrass you. But also get your ish together. Like, read this thing. Be informed. Do not be out here saying stuff that's ahistorical and inaccurate and problematic because friends don't let friends be out here like that. Um, and so also at that time in our lives, I love to say, that she was planning to be a women's studies professor and I was planning to go to law school. Uh, and today she's the attorney and I'm the women's <laughs> We'll take you at a time. In Feminist AF, you have a note to the reader, right? Your young audience, your 13. And I mean, if you take time to talk about the idea of the bad black mom mm -hmm. and how that stereotype has been used to subjugate black women. Um, that's a core a theme throughout your work, of course, um, and they're an overlap for us. I see that trope all the time in my work, child welfare work. Um, why did you think that was such an important issue to raise to your young audience? Yeah, you know, one of the things um, we wrote Feminist AF, we wanted to be in a conversation where we were helping young people sort of get some language to name things and so we were talking about like for instance um a moment where the girl in the family you know black girls uh brown girls get parentified and adultified very early they have lots of caretaking duties compared to their white counterparts and we wanted to sort of name that and talk about like the resentment you might feel because your mom is always saying you gotta babysit x or y or z and so we talk about like your right to have that feeling and also we say to them but like you have to recognize that this is a structural issue about us living in a country that does not have affordable daycare, right? That does not have affordable childcare options. And so you can't take your, your anger out on your parents when if we had a more amenable structure, this it's the structure showing up in your house creating this kind of drama. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of the thing that we talk about um, with young people in that moment is like, the ability to have empathy for the position that your parent might be in, which y'all know as young people, we don't always have. Now, the other side of that is that we also talk slightly crazy to parents too throughout this book, and we're like, you know, um, basically read this book with your young people so that you can understand what their what their positions are, what the things are that they're going through, the world that they're navigating. Um, we say a fairly controversial thing that we think is reasonable about young people and sex, which is your child's sex life is none of your business. Right, which is to say, now if they're being trafficked, abused, groomed, absolutely your business. But our job is to like inform young people. We're, we're, our job is to give them the tools and resources to make good, consensual decisions in the appropriate context, not to sort of feel some type of way about young people being interested in the same stuff that we were interested in as young people and never wanted to talk to our parents about. And also that, you know, patriarchy says that like keeping your children, like not, I don't mean non-consenting age children. I mean like young people, right? Keeping them from sexual activity out of some notion of chastity is patriarchal. And so when you begin to disrupt that value system, you know, so Chanel is a parent, a parent among us, she writes about that and she says like, so after your child starts being sexually active, do you want the conversation to stop then? Or do you want the conversation to keep on going, right? And so that you can make sure that they're healthy interactions, they're making good choices and decisions, and so that your worth or value as a parent isn't based on your child's intimate activity or not. Again, if they're of consenting age and sort of at age appropriate stages with all due caveats, um, and so we're trying to like be the basically inappropriate aunties, <laughs> clearing the pathway for these conversations that trip up young people and their adults, right? Whether they're adults or parents or just their adults, you know? Um, and so, but that means that we couldn't be in a, see, good aunties like are the ones your kids call, but if they're really good aunties, they're also going to say, I don't know your mama like that. You know, I had to tell my nephew recently, like, um, you talk to your mama like that again. And, like the auntie bank bank is gonna dry up. 
You know what I mean? Like, don't do that. You know, because you're supposed to be an ally to everybody in the situation as much as you can. I mean, so, yeah, we also thought it was like a really great way to help young people to understand something about how structures are the thing that split us up in our context. So if you don't have the analysis about patriarchy and family dynamics, and then it's real easy to just be like, why are you always making me drag such and such everywhere that I go? And it's like, well, because I got to work and there's no money to pay for such and such to have daycare. And so then what happens if we then have young people who come up with that analysis? It, it lessens some of the resentment, hopefully, but also it means that maybe when they go to school or they start a career, they think like, we gonna get some public daycare out here so that, I, you know, so that another generation of moms and, and parents and adults don't have to struggle. From your lips. Yeah. Listen, that was. <laughs> um, I'm envious of many qualities of your writing, but perhaps what I'm most envious of is how you can write to so many audiences and you don't dumb down important concepts, you make them really accessible. You know, I enjoy bad feminists, oh, bad feminists, oh my God. I enjoyed all the rage um, because I felt like there were parts of it that spoke to me, and the people in my book club were different ages, different races. One man who also really enjoyed it, um, and we all found parts to be connected to. Yeah. And I felt the same in, in um, feminist AF. Yeah. Even though it wasn't meant to be, although I feel like I take it for some time. <laughs> um, and now you're going to be writing for children. What was that process like yeah. as an academic? Oh well, I mean, look, academia really only you know push you to do one kind of writing, and it's not the kind that anybody really wants to read. Um, <laughs> um, in fact, I think that I have tried to stay connected with food blogging, newsletter writing, all of those things to the audiences that I want to speak to. And so, all of those years when we were writing the front feminist blog, I think of that as practice to learn the art of like how to talk to the people you want to be in conversation with, because right? I. Special training to talk to academics. Um, and, you know, the other thing that, that I sort of think, because I also am trying to like train my students now to be able to do this, right? Um, is that some of the reason why folks don't always write excessively when they come from academics is because they don't actually understand the concepts. Mm -hmm. They just pretend like they understand <laughs> in class. You know, they say a bunch of words, they string them together, and then it's like, like that was word soup and did anyone get it and y'all know the moment where like everyone's like yeah we got it and then it's like well explain it and then they can't right because <laughs> they didn't actually get it or at least that's how i felt first year in a phd program until somebody was like they don't actually understand that stuff and so now i tell my students like actually ask the question because folks might sound like they know it's like the rare one will but many people don't um and so part of it is like that challenge do you actually understand what 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 this thing is and if you do then you should be able to explain that to anybody the five-year-old the ten-year-old the whomever um and so yeah writing for so so like i see my work as writing um specifically for black women and girls but also all interested folks interested in justice across lifespan so you can come to the work as a 25 year old a 40 year old a 50 year old you can come to it as a teenager, you could come to it as a teenager you used to be, right? Which is a lot of young, a lot of adult folk who read from this AF are like, we wish we had this book. And that's what we thought. We wrote the book that we needed with some updates, right? Um, and so we hope in that way that it's feeling. And so writing for, for children just felt like the next logical step, you know? Uh, I mean, of course, I mean, I'm on my fitness auntie again, I'm like, the, the indoctrination starts early. <laughs> How can we get you know young people to sort of so this is a, a book stand up is a book that just highlights like ten black women and girl historical figures that made a change in some way, um, and so it's a way to just like introduce some familiar names Ida B Wells Rosa Parks maybe some less familiar names like Mumbet and Luna Foley, um, but to give young people this kind of expansive view of black women as change makers. And I hope that for black women and girls, they see themselves reflected in the story. We have girls and women across the age group, um, like the, you know, my press team, um, you know, our illustrator, you know, we worked uh, on this book to make sure that it really spanned. Um, and then I think, um, you know, at the same time, I want to, you know, I want anybody that's a, not a black girl reading this book to just grow up in a world where black girls as people of historical importance is part of their narrative. 
not a thing that they have to have you, that they learn in college after learning the wrong thing all K through 12, but that whoever the child is, they grow up with the knowledge that like the world that we know and appreciate was fundamentally shaped by courageous acts of black <coughs> girls and women across time. And who might, might we be if, see, because in that world, then you don't have to, we won't have to wait two more generations or three more generations for another Katanji Brown Jackson mm -hmm. to come along when it just becomes normalized for us that black girls and women are qualified, engaged, you know, all of the things in order to be in these worlds. Um, and, and, you know, we need to do that across the board. We need to do it for indigenous folk and Latinx folk too. Um, our young people have to be able to see um, that the world that we care about wasn't just built by important men, mm -hmm. which is how we learn history in history. Yeah. Um, in addition to your work as an academic, you're obviously an activist also. How do you and how do we harness that eloquent rage and put it into action? What can we do? What, what do you do? How can we learn from you? Um, you know, I say just do the work that you care about. Mm -hmm. Um, that's it. You know, you don't have to be at the protest. You really don't. You don't have to hold up a picket sign. Sometimes the work is teaching. Sometimes the work is writing. Um, you know, even, you know, I did a lot of work in the earlier iteration um, of the movement for Black Lives Matter. My work is the same work there as it is here. You know, they would call me and be like, we need a gender analysis of X, Y, Z, and I would come and I would help to talk about that, or I would be doing teachings about that. I mean, I went to some protests for sure, but, you know, you know, the thing you also learn is that protests in some ways are for young people, you know, uh, you know, they will be out in front and we're young and strong and we'll march all night long, you know. <laughs> I will not. I will not be in there. Okay? Um, but you know, but I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna show up, right? Or we had the you know, all of the attorneys who would come out to these protests and who would who would literally just be observers, legal observers, right? That's really important work. Even um when we went years ago, we took a healing team with us. We had, you know, priestly uh, tail readers, Reiki healers, ministers, all of those things uh, that marched with the crowd and brought like water and um, essential oils and all of these things, recognizing that when you're facing downstate violence, this is a form of trauma. Yeah. Um, and so I say that to say there is a place for everybody and it doesn't have to look the same way. Um, but also, I don't understand my work outside of an activist tradition, right? When we come through the doors of these institutions not good for us, that's activist work, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and look, any of us who have to fight, you know, I mean, let me be very frank, you know, many of us have to fight the kind of limitations of our white colleagues in these spaces that can be quite violent. And you feel like you've been pummeled on a picket line sometimes. I mean, at least sometimes that's not faculty, okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> listen, 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 I don't throw my colleagues in this, but I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I'm a full professor now. I, you know, I just got to put a full professor. Um, <laughs> and I'm only sharing that. I mean, yes, this is life. I'm very proud. But also, um, I'm sharing that to say that um, hopefully what that means is that I become even more bold in the demands that I make of the institution mm -hmm. and in the way that I, you know, try to make space for, you know, one of the reasons I was sort of waxing eloquent in our reception earlier about, like, the importance of libraries, I wasn't doing that, like, as a form of pandering. I'm, like, really concerned about a work, for me, as a working class black girl, first gen college student, like, public library access in a good public school education were the only pathway to the middle class. That's literally the only way I was able to do it. There was no money, there was no, none of that. It had to, you know, like, I came from my, there's one high school in my whole parish, I'm from Louisiana, where we have parishes in not counties. There's one high school in my parish. I went to that high school and in the 90s was able to get the kind of education, even in a poor state like Louisiana, that would equip me to go anywhere and do anything that I wanted to do. And I'm like, that's why when I see these assaults all around the country on good public education, I'm real clear about what the intention is. The intention is to never reproduce people like me, right? And so I'm like, I'm going to try to come for you so you can, so that you don't win that battle, but also, if it is the case, sometimes white supremacy wins. It wins a whole lot. We know it. That's why State Day was the governor of Georgia. White supremacy wins a whole lot, right? 
at the same time, but if it's going to win that battle, it won't win this battle. So I'm giving them hell everywhere. The more yes. access I get, I'm going to be even more of a problem. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> That's why I'm like, and so look, so here's the thing that we probably should say. I mean, I'm going to have to listen. I say things and then they become things. <laughs> okay. But this is the thing I want to say. So even though, like, I think that these battles about, like, critical race theory or whatever are, like, completely asinine. We, no one who knows what critical race theory is is teaching that to, to eight year olds. <laughs> right? Because it's like a specialized branch of the law. Right? So no one's teaching that. I mean, I did learn it as a 15 year old, but I was in favor that we were weird, so we were that kind of stuff, you know, early, but we were precocious, that's what we did. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that we perhaps shouldn't be trying to figure out how to write critical race theory for children. Maybe when, you know, I want all the smoke, I'll write critical race theory for children. Like, maybe I should write a book like that. And then, yeah, like, why, why like, not invite the smoke? Why not invite it? That is part of the point, right, is that all of this is designed to scare us, to silence us. And so when I'm writing children's books and young people's books, I tell people, we say when we are out on tour together, we want black girls to be a whole problem. Oh, right, because people already say we're a problem. So, we, so we're going to do the black version. We're going to be a whole problem. We're going to be, y'all think we're a problem? We're, that's we're correct. A problem. Because the black girl with the knowledge and analysis about how you're criminalizing her and putting her in the school prison pipeline because you have a terrible understanding of culturally competent education, the moment that the 12 year old stands up in your face and can articulate that shit to you, she's a whole problem. And that's the same reason that I wanted to reclaim rage, right? Because all of this stuff gets weaponized against black women and girls. You're a problem, you have attitudes, you're unruly, you're loud. Yeah, loud and right though. <laughs> loud and right, you know what I mean? And that's and then when I teach and my students are like, ooh, you're tough, yeah? Because me being loud doesn't mean that I'm raggedy, it doesn't mean I'm unrigorous. I've read the book, I've read the studies, I've done the work so that when I get loud, I'm loud and right. And so when you're in my classroom, whether you're reading my books or you're listening to me, my demand is always don't be silent, but also be tight. Do your work. Do it rigorously. Do it with care. Don't just be out here spouting off at the mouth and not having things together. That's what the benefit of a good education is. And even if you weren't in an elite institution, that's why time spent in the public library can save your life. That's why. Well, I don't want to hug you. Um, I know that this beautiful audience has a lot of questions for you, and they definitely didn't come to hear me talk. So I'm going to turn it over for audience questions. I got plenty of questions. <laughs> so. Oh, yes. Whenever y'all are ready, you can stand up. Okay, okay. 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 All right. Okay. What inspires you in this age of heightened black awareness and the violence from police and hatred? How do you stay positive? Hmm. Oh, you know, I'm an optimist. Um, I really am. Uh, you know, it's interesting to always have to be on the TV like and white supremacy can what you know, because people think like, oh, you just stuck, you're stuck in the past. No, I'm not. They got I, I really believe that we can actually change this thing. I don't believe that every minute of every day, but I don't allow myself to descend into pessimism in part because I think it's disrespectful to our ancestors to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we think about folks who live their whole lives on plantations. You know, never seen freedom. That didn't mean that freedom didn't come. It did come, you know. And then when it came, we've seen our people sort of make the most out of freedom. There are people who have lived in historic epics where things have changed, where one day things were one way, and they woke up and the next day things were another way. And so we know that that can happen. It doesn't happen a lot, right? But it does happen. And so why not for us? 
right? And the only way that we become unfit for those kinds of changes is if we stop believing in and fighting for the right to make them happen. Um, and look, because we're gonna, because if you don't fight for it, you're gonna see things change in the wrong direction. There is no way that I would have thought when I first started this job, and in fact, when I first started my job and I would be teaching about reproductive justice in my courses, you know, young women would, would, would always be telling me, oh yeah, no, I'm not a feminist. I mean, I believe in women's rights, but I'm not a feminist, and I would be very mad. <laughs> like, what do you mean? How does that work? But now, we're on the brink of Roe v. Wade being struck down. So they're not coming to class saying that anymore, because now they're getting a terrible education in the idea that if you're not vigilant about the gains of a particular moment, you can actually lose those gains, right? The gains that we, we get, we have to be, we have to guard the gates and make sure that we're pushing the arc of history forward, right? It doesn't just naturally go forward. And in fact, there are folks who, you know, want to make America great again and send us back, right? By the make America great again. I mean, in the in the phrase is the path again. Mm -hmm. We want to do a thing we already did. Mm -hmm. See that? It's, I mean, it tells you what its temporality is in the phrase, right? We, we want to go backwards. Even while we're in classes telling people that, you know, we're moving forward. It's you people who are, you know, stuck in the past and stuck on race and can't get past it. And I'm like, oh, they make it weird to great again, people? Yeah. Stuck. I know, I know I'm being radical. I'm also right. Um, yes. You know what I mean? Um, and, and so that is the kind of thing that, you know, that is the kind of thing where when you're faced with the level, like the level of backlash, I'm a, you know, 19th century scholar, in fact. I'm a study, you know, late 19th century black woman into the 20th century. And you never could have told me that we would be trying to go back to a reconstruction era of politics, but we are literally living it. And it is shocking to see, right? And yet, when I read those women, they just were like, we keep getting up every day and fighting for the world that we want, because what other choice is there? And if you don't believe it's going to make a difference, then why did you fight to begin with? Mm -hmm. So I don't allow myself the indulgence of pessimism, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean I'm not clear about the stakes of the moment or how likely we are to lose. It just means that in order for me to get, keep getting up and fighting, I have to believe that it counts. And so all of these fights that we're seeing, all of the protest movements that have risen up really over the last decade, um, and the gains that we're seeing in Congress, in the presidency. I mean, you know, it's not so much about believing in, in kind of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of more to the left than your average liberal, I would say. Um, but I still believe that good government makes a difference in people's lives. I definitely am that kind of chick. I'm like, well, you know, we might need a whole new world, and in fact, I think we do. And also, uh, people need a stimulus checks uh, to survive oh, a pandemic. Oh. And you can believe in both things, right? Mm -hmm. That stimulus isn't what the people deserve, and yet it is the thing that people need in this moment to make it, and it should be extended, and all of these sorts of things. So, I think that. I see signs that we're getting better at our analysis, better at our demands, and one of the things that tells me that is the level and intensity of the backlash. You don't have to fight that hard. You don't have to backlash this hard unless you think the other side is actually winning, mm -hmm. right? And the thing that I, I think that we're winning on, you know, politically, we're, you know, it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be scrappy for sure for a long time. Um, but, the, but the culture wars, part of the reason, even when we watch folks having these culture wars, like the thing you have to zoom out and think, though, is when we're winning the culture wars. I mean, representation is the most diverse we've seen in terms of television stories, podcast stories, even the way young folks are using TikTok. Like, I have real issues with disinformation and all of that. But you're seeing the, the battle be won in these places that matter to us in terms of like visual representation. And I think that that's what has the other side scared. And so when the other side is running scared, you know, you have to not retreat. You have to see that as the death rattle that it is, right? Um, and that's when you have to keep pushing. And so that means that you can't believe their narrative. You have to believe yours. And so my narrative is, in the end, we will win. Mm -hmm. And so keep running. All right. How can we enhance your access to your messages? Uh, and messages from eloquent rage for all women of color, including those living in rural areas, mm -hmm. those who lack internet access, etc. Mm -hmm. And how can university students I, uh, spread these messages? Oh yeah, this is interesting. This is interesting. Well, um, 
I mean, I think the thing is, you know, as a as a university professor whose family members all still live kind of rurally or semi-rurally, quite, quite frankly, um, you know, I think that this is about the conversations that we have with these people. I also find it interesting sometimes when we sort of, I'm always interested in the way we deploy categories, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, it's like how my generation grew up hearing about inner city children, mm -hmm. right? inner city youth or whatever. Um, and so in this moment, I almost feel a little bit like some of that is happening around the world, right? Um, and I'm like, I grew up in the country, like, I mean, straight up rural, like my, my, my family's ancestral homeland in the States is a place that is classified on the census as a village, not a town, <laughs> because it's not even big enough to be a town. Um, and until the late 90s, my grandmother was like, you know, so I, you know, I tell the story about going home and I'm riding through the center of town with my grandmother. There's one stoplight and she says, look, we got a fire station. We're coming on up. And I was like, what? <laughs> as much as y'all burn trash out here in the country, outside the city, but it's like, what do you mean y'all just got a fire station? <laughs> so, um, but I, don't, I didn't live in a place where people were short on reading material where they couldn't get access to a library. I came from women who read and farmed uh, and raised chickens. Um, and so I want to just suggest that if you want folks in these areas to read books, make sure they're available in the public library. Make sure that you know the conversations are available in all the venues that can be. I recognize that there are issues of access. Um, but typically, any, anywhere that calls, um, you know, not anywhere, but most, many places that call, um, I'm willing to go and to have the conversation. And I'm certainly happy to be in conversation with rural folks because those are my folks. I think they don't know it. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. I grew up in shotgun country and, you know, deer meat country. And, you know, this is like, this is home for me, not not big city living. And so where I live in Jersey is like, you know, Jersey's, you know, besides the turnpike is super, you know, it's super green and there are deer just sort of all around. My mother came to visit and she was like, we sent you far away so that you wouldn't have to live like this. And this is what you chose. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you chose. I was like, well, this is what feels like home, you know? Get into the city pretty quick. I mean, I can't, I, you know, I can't, but that's also the point, right, is that it's like, I want proximity to the city, but I don't necessarily want to make city life in that way. And so um, I'm, I'm a, a girl who's real good in a kind of kind of small town context where I'm sort of like honking at drivers, you know, you have the, the water pile who are like crossing the street systematically, you know, in the mornings or whatever, and I love it because all the 18 wheelers have to stop for them, and it really infuriates them, and I'm like prepared to pull the car, I'm like, you will stop, you will stop. to it because I love it. Mm -hmm. You know, I keep on doing it because I love You see how I said with like a little bit of resignation? <laughs> well, I show, you know, I love these, you know, I love the kids, you know, even though I'm working in a school system with limited resources or, you know, this work is so important. I love this work even though I've been undermined in my decision-making capacity or I don't have, you see that? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Right, so I'm really interested in how we invoke love as the thing that keeps us coming back to a set of conditions that are largely untenable. Mm -hmm. um, and I particularly wonder about that with women of color. Mm -hmm. Because we feel this sort of duty to keep showing up to institutions and movements and places and people that do not love us, mm -hmm. right? Because we love them and because we see their potential, right? And we see all the things they could be and then we become the bridge, the resource, the prayer club. We become everything even when they don't feel the need to give us anything. And the language we use for that is love. Mm. Um, and so I'm trying to be in movements and spaces that do not take my love for things as a context or a pretext to exploit me. Come on. Right?
right? Um, and so when I was in my twenties, me and my homegirl, we just used to, you know, we would be out here dating raggedy dudes or whatever. You know, I mean, you know, thankfully it was in there. You know, per raggedy persons, you know what I mean? Right, just raggedy. Okay. And um, raggedy knows no gender, it's just out we would be out here, you know, and everything. We'd be like, but I love him, you know, but I just love him, you know, <laughs> all of that shit, right? And one day we just looked at each other, we were like, yeah, but love is not enough. <laughs> love is not enough, right? You gotta do these other things. And I think that that is the thing that I'm sort of coming to, right? Is love is not enough, right? Love is absolutely everything. It is the thing that brings us back into, but what happens if those of us who, who do things out of love what happens if we like take our power from that back and say, it ain't that I don't love you, it, this, whatever. It's that it's not enough. It's not worth my life. It's not worth my health. It's not, you see what I mean? Yeah. You know, like we gotta have a different narrative about that. And I think that's so hard because I think that actually, um, I, I feel like when I watch things happening that the world is predicated particularly on the idea, I think like US white supremacy actually um, takes a lot of its boldness and audacity in our US context from the idea that black women will love this place anyway. Mm -hmm. I think that that emboldens it. Well, black women won't throw us away. You know, like in corporate, they say they give you glass cliff assignments, right? Uh, you know, glass ceiling, you shatter through glass cliff, they bring you in when things are on tilt and then tell you to save it. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever you may feel about Kamala Harris, I mean, she kind of got a class glass uh, cliff assignment in being the VP in this moment. Katanji Brown Jackson, this is these are glass cliff assignments, right? Mm -hmm. America is, I mean, we can't even figure out how to respond properly to a pandemic. We're the richest country in the world. We have the most resources in the world, and we've had the most cases and the most deaths of anywhere else in the world. And then we tell black women, yay, you're gonna get a, a black Supreme Court justice. When the country falling apart, <laughs> you know, they, you know, in 2008, the economy went belly up and white people said, we'll elect Barack Obama now, Say, seriously. <laughs> and so then he comes in and he saves it and everybody hates him for it. Right. But really, it was like, we hadn't seen that kind of crisis in the economy in 2008 in a lifetime. And that's when folks were like, well, give it to the black man, see what he can do. Maybe he's closer to Jesus. Like, really, this is the kind of stuff y'all be doing to black folks, right? Well, it's, it's on tilt now, you know, the world is going to shit, so now we'll, we'll have some diversity. And the thing that's crazy is, though, it's the, it's, the thing is, it's sometimes the smartest move ever, because since black women are used to making nothing out of, I mean, something out of nothing, I mean, our whole lives, you know, when Tupac said, I make a dollar out of 15 cents, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a black woman's whole ethic. <laughs> Just, you know, give me nothing, but I'll make something out of it. We call that black girl magic or whatever. Like, <laughs> you see my face, right? It's like, um, that's what I'm saying. But, like, you know, we'll give, you know, the country's like going to pop in many critical ways. And then people be like, we're going to, you know, now it's time for a sister to leave. And so black women are out here like, yes, finally we're getting our shot. But also, Imagine what would happen if we had gotten our shot in a different moment, right? A resource shot to do it. We do this to black children. We'd be like, yeah, you know, they're resilient. I hate that word. I, I have removed it from my vocabulary. I do not use it to talk about black people. I do not use it to talk about black children. Um, I do not like the word resilience because resilience means how much can we take away until they die? Ooh. Right, I take this away, they pop back up. Resilience! <laughs> they don't have this, make it anyway. Resilience! <laughs> right? And so the marker becomes either you're resilient or you die. And it's like, no, no. And so, yeah, this is this is the other thing I think. I mean, I know I said I was an optimist a moment ago, and now I'm like, <laughs> like a pessimist, but I'm really just trying to say that. We have a country that is very romanticizes the way that black women in particular love this place. Mm. We love its principles, we love what it could be, we love its set of possibilities. That's why when you look at public employment, when you look at like who runs diversity and inclusion programs and these corporations and institutions, there's always a black and brown girl all the time. Right. Always. You're always the ones being like, 
like, maybe I can help you get your such and such through. Or, you know, we're the confidants and the, you know, the counselors for, you know, powerful men, right? Because that is, you know, I call it the custodial labor, right? And that's not a disrespect to folks who do custodial labor, it's respect. We don't want to keep the lights on, the building running, everything looking clean and nice and inhabitable. We're the people that make this place inhabitable. And by this place, I mean the United States. Right? We're the folks that make the government inhabitable. Right? We're the people that make public space inhabitable. That's what I'm saying. That's what we do to black women. And then, after we do all of that, then we don't take care of those systems. We don't help them out. We, we, don't, we don't respect them. Right? We have a shining moment. We see Katanji Brown Jackson, and black women are proud of her. Proud because look at what she represents. She is excellent, yes. right? This I'm not even talking about politics. I'm just talking about she is excellent. Mm -hmm. And we have been treated for the last two days to her just being disrespectful, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is literally a black woman's condition. And then what is she sitting there saying? What is she saying? Her opening statement. I love this country and I love the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Love. See that word again? Mm -hmm. She said it as the pretext to show up to have some of the most powerful men in the world disrespect her ritually for 12 hour days over the next three days. Mm -hmm. That is what it means to be a black woman. You love a thing, so you fight to be in a thing so that you can do a thing. And the price of the ticket is ritual disrespect from white men who don't have half the qualifications. <laughs> So thank you all so much for coming. And thank you.